Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to be back. I've been gone for, what, three weeks now? Lord, put some things on my heart that I hope you will all be blessed. So, Father in heaven, I thank you that you gave us your word. You gave us the words of eternal life, and, and the Bible is a witness of your word, and we thank you. And we know that your word will always return back to you with the very thing that you intended it to achieve. So we just put our faith in who you are and who your son is, and we thank you, Father. And I ask in mighty Jesus' name that the grace of God that brings salvation appear to these men and teaching them that by denying ungodliness, they will live righteously and soberly in this present evil world, looking for that blessed hope and coming of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father in heaven. Let the word go forth in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, I've been uh, reading a lot of things in Scripture and studying many things. And I've heard, uh, you know, there's a common theme now, how the world is trying to redefine love. And um, what's on my heart today is more of my first-hand personal testimony, first-hand actual experience in my life. You see, there's a parable in, in the Bible in Luke chapter 10 called the, the Good Samaritan. And the Bible says that you should love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And there was a Pharisee that wanted to stand on his own self-righteousness, justify himself. So he challenged Jesus and said, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus gives this parable of the Good Samaritan. He said, a certain man <coughs> fell among thieves and a Pharisee see him laying there and walked the other way. Later on, a scribe came and he seen the man laying there and he walked the other way. Now in Jewish law, you have to help your enemy's ox out of a ditch. How much more a man? And this man was obviously the victim of a crime, and they were guilty of negligence, okay? According to their own law. But then a good Samaritan came by and saw this man laying there. He didn't care how he got there or who beat him up because they're gone. And he had compassion on this man, and he bound up his wounds, and he took him to an inn. Today we call it a hospital or treatment facility of some sort gave them a down payment and said, if he overspends his bill, I'll settle up when I return. And then the story ends there, and Jesus challenged the Pharisees and said, now which one was a neighbor to him? Well, obviously the Samaritan was, right? Well, I've heard a lot of people say many criticisms about why we are down here why our motives are, what our motives are. I've heard people criticize the pastor here and say he has no love. They say he has no heart. But when I was homeless for seven years, he gave me a home. He fed me from that table. My life is proof of action and deeds. So, from my point of view, how do you refute that? Who would take a throne with who would take a throne with force that he has earned by good deeds? So, it's my hope that you guys recognize a little bit of this. Have respect and whatever beefs you, beefs you guys got out there on the street, keep them there. But this place is a place of peace. All right? And you keep your beefs down there, over there. We can't make you guys all get along. But here, you keep your beefs elsewhere. Okay? Because this is a ministry that actually cares for you guys. We're not just all about screaming a bunch of Bible verses in your ear, okay? We actually care for you, and we haven't stopped yet. And 
this ministry has been more a brother to me than my own family. And that is a testimony because Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and so glorify God in heaven. And it says in the book of Deuteronomy that after you restore the pledge to somebody, that poor man goes home and gives glory to God and it shall be righteousness to your account in heaven. So the call and the reason God put us down here for you is laying up treasure in heaven. And any one of you could turn any time except the Lord Jesus. And the change takes a while, but it comes. But it's the love of God that started it. It's the love of God that motivates us. So having said that, I'm going to come into my message now today on the number one offender in addiction programs. They say anger is the number one offender. There was a story in the Bible about a man named Jonah who decided he didn't want to do what God had wanted him to do. Jonah was blinded by his patriotism. He thought Israel had the corner on God and he didn't want those sinners over there to enjoy God's mercy. God wanted to have compassion on the city called Nineveh and he sent Jonah to go preach to the city. Jonah didn't want to do it, so he went the other way. To make a long story short, Jonah finally cries out to God. When he's in the belly of the whale, he cries out to God. And God didn't just sit up there and say, well, you disobeyed, stay there and rot. But he didn't just come down and save him right away either. But eventually, God beats the whale, spit Jonah out, Jonah gives one sentence. Forty days, the city will be overthrown, and he preached. And the king of Nineveh had enough faith to believe what Jonah was saying, and he declared a fast over the whole city. He said, not even the cows can eat. So Jonah is now sitting on a hill outside the city, and the countdown. And he's waiting for God to come in and level the place. And God saw Nineveh's works, that they cried out and they fast and they humbled themselves before the God of heaven. So God relented of the evil that he was going to do and he decided to not level the place. And Jonah gets angry. And, Jonah get, and God asked the same question to Jonah twice. Jonah gets angry and he's sulking because God spared the city. So God makes a plant grow up to shelter Jonah from the scorching sun of his own hatred. And Jonah gets all happy. He was happy when God comforted him, but he was mad when God was good to those other guys over there. So then God sent a worm and the tree died, or the plant died. And now Jonah's mad again. And God asks him a question, do you have a right to be angry? And that's the title of my message today. Do you have a right to be angry? And Jonah says, yes I do, even unto death. And then God points to the plant that died and said, you had compassion on that plant because it comforted you. But what about 120,000 souls and their cattle? Do you have a right to be angry? And then the book ends there. The story of Jonah ends there. And the reader is left in limbo. And part of the message of the book of Jonah is, do you have a right to be angry? I hear a lot of people, they're mad at God because of this, that, and the other thing. But there's always somebody going through something worse. And do you have a right to be angry? There are many people struggling with addictions, traumatized past, legitimate resentments. <coughs> some people have had some horrible things done to them. And I get it. 
why people turn to addictions. Some people have all kinds of trauma bonds and attachment disorders and all this other stuff that you didn't ask for. You're born into a family that was a mess from the get-go. And some of your resentments might even be valid and legitimate. And we, because we have a fallen nature, have a tendency to lay at God's door things that he had nothing to do with. And when evil happens to us, we tend to blame God for stuff that he never even planned for us, things that he never even desired for us. And we get angry. I've talked with a lot of people. They're angry at God because so-and-so died, or they're angry at God because they lost their home. I've had some stuff, and God asked me the same question. Many times, do you have a right to be angry? And Jonah was the kind of fellow that got angry because God was so good, and he said, I knew you were merciful, and I knew you are full of compassion. That's why I didn't want to obey you. So Jonah was the kind of guy that withheld mercy, withheld truth, kept it all to himself, and he did not want to share it out, and he did not want to see God heal and forgive and save. <clears throat> there are many people that will preach the wrath of God, but then when God comes down and turns it around and he starts saving people, they get angry. There's another man in the Bible that got angry. It's in Luke chapter 15, five chapters later. It's the story of the prodigal son. This kid left home, wasted all of his living. Finally, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And the father ran to him, killed the calf, get the best robe, get the ring, get the shoes, and restore him back. And the older brother was mad. He hears the commotion and says, what are these things made? And, the older, and then they told the older brother, oh, your father's happy. The party is happening because your younger brother has returned home safe and sound. And the older brother was mad. What? I mean, he's partying before he left. He partied when he now he left. And now they're partying again. Is life just one big party to you guys? Father, I've obeyed you. I worked down in your field my whole life. I never broke your commandment. <coughs> I deserve it. You never killed a fatted calf for me. How many people are mad at God? They say, you never did nothing for me, God. That's what this one was angry about. He says, you know, this son of yours, he went out and squandered everything. And you make a fatted calf for him and party. And the father explains himself and says it was necessary to party because he was lost, now he's found. He's dead, now he's alive. Why wouldn't we party? And that older brother who thought he was so obedient, was so angry, he walked away from his dad. He didn't even care that his father was happy that he received his son back. See, when you love somebody, when they're happy, you're happy. You're happy for them. When you love God, when God recovers what he lost, you're happy for God. And Jesus said, therefore there are angels that have joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And if even just one of you, would, with your whole heart, turn to him, you start a party in heaven. Because heaven is happy to have you back once again because of what Jesus has done for you. And God loves you, and he wants you back, and he'll gladly take you back. So he's not just going to say, okay, you're forgiven, now get out of here. He won't forgive you at a distance. Now this older brother was angry because his father was so good that he walked away. Now where do you think that angry older brother is going to wind up? Is he going to go back to the field and work for the father that he's mad at? That's religion. Or is he going to have destination pig pen? 
because that's where anger, if you don't release it, can take you. So that younger brother, though he squandered his life, <coughs> he was restored. And anger will take you right back down to the pig pen that that younger one was saved from. Just like Jonah's anger wound him up in the belly of a whale. And even once he got rescued out of it by God, he was still mad. So the Bible says that anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Because anger destroys your wisdom. And anger will not rest until all of your wisdom, your common sense, is destroyed. Then anger can rest in your heart now. Okay? So you can start out wise and clever and smart. But if you don't learn and release your anger and forgive everybody, and your legitimate resentments too, go on the altar and ask God to empower you to forgive. And if you do that, Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. Okay? So, if we don't forgive, our anger can take us right back to our old life. So I'm going to close with this. Wherefore, put away the old man and put away anger, wrath, malice, bitterness, and envy. And put yourself on the new man which is recreated in Christ Jesus in true righteousness and in true holiness, not self-righteousness, but true righteousness, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And that's my close today. Don't let your anger take you down to the pig pen. May you be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs>